How's it going, hockey fans? This is episode 76 of the Clapper Cast. It's February 1st, 2021, a new month, same podcast. Uh, I'm Burke, and as always, joined by my co-host, Sean. Sean, how's it going, sir? You know, I'm doing better than the Vancouver Canucks are tonight, that's for sure. Yeah, I thought it was illegal to have live murder displayed on uh, on TV, um, which is what the Habs are doing to the Canucks uh, yet again. Yeah, after that first series, uh, the Habs is kind of dismantling the Canucks at every turn. They uh, took a bit of a break. Vancouver went and got some confidence against Ottawa for c- a couple of blowout games there. And they go and play the Habs and immediately get brought back down to earth. Like a minute into the game, Nick Suzuki scores and uh, <laughs> set the tone for the rest of the game. It's what about two minutes left in the third, and it's six-two Habs. So, oof, yeah, yeah. The Canucks uh, looked looked sharp against Ottawa, but um, that's not exactly a very high bar right now. So, um, kind of as you mentioned, kind of back down to reality here, as uh, they get stomped yet again. And so, tough yeah. time for for the Canucks when they play the Habs. Yeah, um, I mean, fully with another point, another goal tonight. So it's kind of funny. Continues the revenge tour. <laughs> yeah. Um. I mean, like with the Senators, they've uh, they had that opening opening day win, and then they've just really struggled since. And I mean, they had kind of a scoring duel against the Edmonton Oilers last night, where that was a stressful experience. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, what even is defense or goaltending, right? <laughs> it was like five goals in the first ten minutes of the game. <laughs> yeah, and Murray got pulled like instantly. Seven minutes in, I think Edmonton scores three, and Murray gets pulled. <laughs> Looking at some of the goals, though, I mean, you can't fault them on all of them, right? Not all at those, all. Those the Sens, three. the Sens defense is like a massive block of Swiss cheese. Like they don't. They don't have much going on back there. I mean, the same goes for Edmonton in that game as well. They were just kind of leaving Skinner out to dry in his first NHL start. Bit of a tough one to yeah. Bit of a tough one to deal with there on both ends defensively. Yeah, it. Um, I mean, this is kind of what we we touched on when Murray got uh, traded for and then signed in Ottawa. Is that uh, it was a bit of an overpaid? And I remember saying, "Hey, we're gonna suck for a while." We're going to pay you a little bit extra money to put up with it. And that was kind of one of those nights where he didn't even play the whole game, but it was like, you know what? Let's yoink here. This is going to, this is just not going to be a great game. And, you know, Hogberg went in and he, he let up what, like another four five. or five more. Um, so yeah, just not a great night for the senators, but you know, they, they did get a few, but yeah, it's just a tough look. Um, the the Oilers, you know, everyone's talking about how McDavid had five points and Drysaddle had six, mm-hmm. but I think they both finished minus one. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, they're great on special teams, but that defense though, <laughs> not great. Yeah, that's basically what happened last season too, where most of McDavid and Drysaddle's production, or a significant portion of it anyways, was on special teams, on the power play. So that doesn't affect the plus-minus. Then they go 5v5, and this is an area they've struggled uh, for years, that they're a weak 5v5 versus 5 team, so they end up giving up a lot of goals. And we impact plus-minus, but then they go on the power play and make it up, make up for it in that way. So that's kind of where, where it balances out. It just doesn't reflect in the score sheet. Yeah, it's... Uh tough tough look um but uh i mean a lot of positives for the Oilers coming out of that i mean they got their power play going um tyson berry seems to have uh you know got his groove back he's got five five points in his last three games so um that's that's a positive for him um got he got his first goal as an oiler yeah um i'm sure he would have liked to have scored that against the leafs instead of the sins but i'm oh, not for sure, sure he'll I mean, take it Dominic yeah, Cahoon got his first cool. couple of goals. James Neal got a couple of goals. So, I mean, it's you know looking good for kind of the midline production if they can get that on a more regular basis. But um, we'll have to wait and see on that because that's been a continual issue for this team as well. Yeah, well, at least it uh, gets some guys going, um, you know, get them on the board, kind of 
um, get rid of that. Uh, not really a slump, but you know, like get, that monkey get off yourself the back, right? into it. Get get the points going a bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, hopefully for for your sake, they don't collapse when they play the Montreal Canadiens next. Because apparently, if you beat the Senators by a lot, um, the Habs will just come into town and <laughs> well, the Habs dismantled <laughs> the down Oilers on in uh, games so. I was like two or two and three of the season. So we'll uh, have to wait and see how the rematch goes if the team can figure that out. <laughs> well, we'll 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 see. Um, I'm excited to see. Really, any game that Montreal is yeah. playing in, they're really fun to watch. They are. You know, before the season started, when we were doing our North Division preview, we were kind of, we were talking about how, of all of the teams in the North Division, Montreal is the only one that doesn't have question marks on defense or goaltending, and that is really showing in this division with so much offensive firepower, how far that is going to take a team when they have, you know, the forward depth that Montreal has, but also just that defense and goaltend, the reliable defense and goaltending. You see, like. Ottawa, Vancouver, and Edmonton are all struggling big time in that regard, and it's costing them a lot of games. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you can't can't win games if you're giving up a million breakaways a game. Um, your defense needs to be solid. You need that great first breakout pass. You need to be able to make smart plays, make, make the safe play. And I think a lot of those guys on the Habs do that really well. I mean... Shea Weber has made his whole career on that, basically making the safe, smart play. And they've got, uh, you know, Ben Sherratt does kind of the same thing. Um, Petrie has a bit more skill and can, you know, walk the line a bit and all that. And, um, yeah, they, they've just got a, a solid team. And, uh, you know, it's kind of built from the back out. And um, having Carey Price and, and Jake Allen is, is such a luxury, like you mentioned the one team in Canada where it's kind of like, okay, well, they're set. They're set in the in the pipes. So, um, you know, just being able to have confidence in whoever's in net there is, is amazing. And Jake Allen has just looked really good in the in the backup role. Um, it's it's really suiting him. I think it's it's very, a really it was a really smart move by Bergerman to bring him in there. Exactly, exactly. Like that's. Like we talked about, that's a struggle that the Habs have had in the past is they don't have anybody to take some of the load off of Carey Price. And Price ends up overworking himself in the regular season and kind of falters down the stretch into the playoffs. So Jake Allen's going to give that rest to Carey Price during the regular season. That's going to lend itself well to making the Habs prime for a deep run in the playoffs. Yeah, and I think Carey Price is a, a good jumping off point for kind of the biggest news of the week. Um, and that is the fact that Chris Kreider apparently punched Tony D'Angelo in the face, and it's something that even Habs fans can rally behind Kreider as <laughs> just a just a great yeah, guy. He, <laughs> so captain, you know, <laughs> you know, give him all the humanitarian awards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, Kreider's you know used to be you know enemy number one, public enemy number one in Montreal because of you know when he crashed into Carey Price back in, you know, the day. Um, but you know, that's a long time ago and you know the the context of this is really important. So um in case you haven't heard, Tony D'Angelo is, is um he's <laughs> he's he's moved to, to right wing. <laughs> 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 and uh it, the Rangers have basically had enough. And uh, there was an altercation in the dressing room. Um, it was in the tunnel, reportedly, um, where it was it was kind of spurred on by the fact that there was a miscommunication between Georgiev and D'Angelo in overtime, where D Georgiev went to play the puck, and I guess D'Angelo was going for it behind the net. And then you can just see D'Angelo just totally gives up on the play at that point, and. Uh, the Penguins get it, and Crosby shoots it, and D'Angelo's basically screening his own goalie and doesn't even make a real good attempt to block the shot. Crosby puts it on the ice right by him, and uh, it's, it was kind of a soft goal to let in for Georgiev, sure, but um, apparently D'Angelo took issue with that and uh, got in his grill after the game, and Kreider stepped up, and <laughs> I guess... 
knocked him down a peg down yeah, to reality so um i think uh the crier part is still the unconfirmed rumor the confirmed part is don't ruin it for me <laughs> <laughs> um the, the part that we know is more confirmed coming from like more reliable sources is that after the game Georgiev was kind of sitting kind of doing the sullen i just lost a game now i'm kind of pissed off thing and d'angelo walked by him in the tunnel or something and made a sarcastic remark or something it directed at Georgiev about the play and that kind of sparked an altercation between the two and I think it led to I think it led to Georgiev um physically hitting D'Angelo and then it started an altercation between the two and then other teammates had to step in um beyond that it's still kind of unconfirmed we don't have the official like video or that apparently exists or you know reports from anybody about what happened but uh after after that started to break out, uh, you know, we've learned today that after the games two and three of the regular season when D'Angelo was healthy scratched, um, D'Angelo couldn't handle it. He wouldn't get over it. And he was told by the organization or by the coach or someone that, you know, this is your last straw, basically. You don't have another shot. Like, keep if you're in, if you make another issue, you're gone or you're done. And this altercation was that last straw, so he got waived. Um, today, the rangers dm came out and said like this he's played his last game as a ranger um you know he's done their he went unclaimed on waivers now they're just looking for you know i'm assuming a trade partner i genuinely hope that nobody takes his con him or his contract but uh we'll have to wait and see on that part yeah he's like what six games into a brand new contract yeah. way to go tony um i'm just i'm just looking at some tweets here and um Apparently, Keandre Miller was the player who broke up the altercation between Georgiev and D'Angelo. And um, I'm just looking at the, the top comments here on Reddit by a guy named Visible Ducks. And it says, Keandre continuing to prove that he is far superior at defending his goalie than <laughs> D'Angelo. <laughs> <laughs> so, shout out to that guy for uh, a, a solid comment. But, um, you know, it, it sounds like there was also some issues between D'Angelo and Keandre Miller. And, um, um, you know, Keandre Miller happens to be a black player. Um, and apparently there was some people who felt really uneasy about, um, you know, D'Angelo's opinions. I don't know. There's nothing confirmed or yeah, anything. Yeah, nothing about that part is confirmed. A of a, and the, um, um, Keandre Miller's side and, like, his agent, they're kind of all refuting that part, that there was no actual issues between them. So, you know, we're still kind of waiting to see if more comes out. But, you know it seems like this might be a case of where there's smoke there's fire where there might be something there it just might not be what we think it is or the extent we think it is yeah and you know it allegedly caused a bit of a rift in the in the locker room not even a rift it's just one i think everybody was just against one person um and tony d'angelo has a track record of kind of being on the wrong side of, of things like this it's um, not kind of back he is to... on the wrong side <laughs> <laughs> there is no kind He's... of in there <laughs> yes yes um he was on the wrong side back in his ohl days too where he got in some situations that were very similar and so um you know we don't want to of course accuse anything with with no basis in reality but you know when you when you have a track record of being let's not uh you know Let's not be too nice here. If you're, you've got a track record of being a piece of shit, you know, sometimes that uh, <laughs> reputation precedes you and um, it leads people to, to judging you on that. And he's done really nothing to prove that he isn't. And so, um, you know, props for the Rangers to, to kind of saying, you know, if uh, Gordon apparently said, you know, like if I hear your name come up, uh, anything about you being um, a healthy scratch, you know, you're done. And then Gordon has a quote saying, like, I had to stick up to, to my word here. And, you know, yeah, exactly. if you're not going to be a team player, we don't want you on our team. And so they're trying to find a trade for him. And, um, of course, his agent definitely <laughs> thinks that there's a trade option available. But, um, you know, uh, right now when there's you know so much going on with the taxi squad and COVID and all that sort of stuff, you know, who's going to really want to take a shot at a guy who's, causing rifts in the locker room and has all this 
weird rumors about him and stuff. You know, and especially with the contract that he has and what he provides on ice. His on ice performance this year hasn't exactly been great. So yeah, I don't and know. And this if he's uh, really that's, that's a, a perfect segue into this tweet here that I'm looking at from uh, Evolving Wild that the Rangers kept D'Angelo on their roster for years because, frankly, he was a valuable defenseman. Despite all of his serious and problematic issues, they committed to him because they only cared about his on-ice impact. This is how the NHL works, and it's a major problem. Now, D'Angelo's on-ice impact last year was pretty all right. You know, he's solid offensive defenseman, you know, top five in the league in points and for defenders. This year he sucks, and suddenly, you know, his on-ice impact is no longer, you know, protecting his reputation and actual actions of being a garbage person and you know that's kind of the final straw there you know time to move on and um i was telling you sean that uh, i hope he gets i thought i was hoping he got claimed by a team in in california so that he would have to live in the most liberal <laughs> place in, in in the u.s um <laughs> And yeah, I think that'd be funny. Or heaven forbid that he gets claimed by some Canadian team and then has to come up oh to God. to the socialist utopia that is Canada, and has to deal with COVID, you know, and all that sort of stuff, getting through the border. Um, that would have just been funny. But you know, I don't. I'm glad that I'm also glad that no Canadian team claimed him. I yeah, genuinely I hope team's worse. that no team acquires him because he has completely worn out his welcome through his entire career of not learning from his mistakes, from his, you know, issues. Like, he has never shown any ability to change or reflect on his past actions and change himself to be a better person. And he's now been shown the door from three different NHL organizations in, what, what five years since he's been drafted? You know, that's how many chances do you yeah. get? Yeah, well, maybe he can uh, call up Brendan Leipzig's agent and uh, hop on a plane over to Russia and, um, you know, play in the most conservative, pl one of the most con conservative places on the planet in Russia. Um, you uh, you laugh, but Tony's uh, alleged burner account on Twitter uh, now follows the KHL. That was a that was a new <laughs> discovery in the last couple of days. No, I mean, it's, it would perfectly make sense if he goes to the KHL because I think the NHL is really, you know, especially after the Mitchell Miller thing, like, I, I, you know, we don't know what's going on with, with Tony D'Angelo. We don't know all the whole story, but after the shit that hit the fan with that Mitchell Miller thing, you know, like I think teams really kind of woke up to be like, we can't be silent on this anymore. And like, you know, we, we kind of got to live up to that, yeah. uh, on and off ice uh, exactly. isn't both important. Like the thing is, these players are public figures, and they are representing these organizations. And organizations do not and should not be okay with people like Tony D'Angelo, who very openly support dangerous and harmful ideas. They shouldn't be okay with you know giving them a platform and giving them you know the ability to represent that organization. That's not that's not good, and it's kind of neglecting the fact that you know they are hockey players that's their main job but you know they are also public figures you know they're role models for kids they're you know supposed to be community members community heroes doing lots of you know community work and charity work and stuff like that and you have players like d'angelo and you know spreading his harmful ideas and it's just really it's really harmful and a really bad look for an organization for a league that's needing to make changes yeah and it's uh you know it's not about his political beliefs like he would probably say it's just about being a dirtbag and a bad teammate and a bad locker room presence you know yeah, exactly like, you're just bad for the team overall you're bad for the players you're bad yeah. for the and fans like you're the just, perfect kind of it's not great you know build off of that like it's not about his political beliefs it's about how he acts as a teammate and how he treats other people you've got guys like seth jones you know, Zach Wierenski, Max Domi, you've got other players who have similar beliefs, but they're not issues because they don't seem to be, you know, bad people in the locker room. They're not bad teammates from the sounds of anything. Like, they can get along with players, with other teammates, and they're not, you know, openly spreading hate to other people, you know? Yeah, like, you can still be a good teammate and have whatever political beliefs. You don't, you know, you can keep that separate. And uh, it's... It's just like you don't talk work 
Like you don't talk politics or religion at work, right? Like, <laughs> and when you're a public figure, whenever you mention it, people are going to tie it to to the, the team that you work with and your teammates and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, yeah, it's just a, a dirt bag and, you know, however much media he gets is too much. Um, he's really kind of, he's earned the Brennan Leipzig treatment, I think. And, you know, I'm sure he'll, he'll go to some Russian team and experience what, uh, what the joys of the KHL is. And, you know, I'm sure, all the best in his career, but, um, yeah, weird guy. Hopefully he can turn it around and, and learn from this, but from his burner account, <laughs> I, I think it's safe to say <laughs> that he won't. Yeah, from his burner account and the um, other seven times he's had the same type of issue come up with uh, getting suspended from his own team and getting traded and sent out of other organizations and... <laughs> I don't think he's going to learn. <laughs> yeah. No. So I guess um, I think that this is uh, ultimately a good thing for the Rangers. It'll probably bring the locker room together. Um, you know, they've got some, some bright young players that are ready to, to – or ha have already basically taken his spot. Yeah. And so – um, it'll allow them to not have any sort of controversy about, yeah, this guy's in the lineup and this guy's not. Um, it's, you know, you've literally, you've played your last game as a Ranger. Bye. Um, we've decided <laughs> that yeah. you're replaceable. Um, and so I think, yeah, like, like I said, I think it'll bring the room together and, and, yeah, and they won't have that distraction of this guy spouting off and making it all about him. Yeah. And like, this is a, pivotal year for the rangers in in that locker room in that culture because this is their first year without henrik lundquist you know longtime ranger kind of the, the rallying point for the team uh they lost mark stall to trade in the offseason as well and that's like two central figures veteran figures in that locker room that are gone and suddenly there's this leadership void there's a culture void and you know to have the chance to kind of bring everybody together and give them something to bond over, something to move forward together on, and, you know, a moment like, you know, banding together, um, you know, could be a good, you know, propulsion forward for the team, uh, for the, you know, le next leadership group of the Rangers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. Could be a huge moment for the team moving forward. Um, you know, they've had some guys with some slow starts, and um, maybe this is just kind of the, the thing to get over the, the drama and to focus on hockey and getting better and improving and uh, battling every night and not worrying about how somebody in the press box is, is dealing with it. And, you know, that person's gone now and let's move on. Let's play hockey and uh, stop talking about healthy scratches and put Jack Johnson in <laughs> <laughs> once he's not hurt anymore. And uh, also, yeah, Shout out to Sidney Crosby for uh, ending a man's career, basically. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's the hero of oh, New York. Yeah. The hero the hockey world needed. <laughs> <laughs> by, by absolutely walking a, a defenseman in a overtime. Defenseman in air quotes. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess actually Matt Barzell walked him in like game one. Yeah, too, well, Matt so, Barzell sent him um, to the taxi squad and Crosby ended his career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so <laughs> he can rest easy knowing that two canadians just absolutely ended his career <laughs> it wasn't anything to do with him it was just you know these two canadian guys that embarrassed him he didn't embarrass himself and these other guys other people their fault <laughs> yeah let's uh let's move on from from tony d um i wanted to mention um just kind of how uh, Zadino Chara has been fitting in with the Capitals. And um, he scored his first goal against the Islanders in a game where the Islanders were up 3-0 going into the second period. And the Capitals scored five goals in the second in the span of like three minutes or something crazy. <laughs> um, and Chara got a goal. He also got an assist in that period. 
Um, and he scored from the point, and he was on the side where the Capitals bench was. And when he scored, he went to the bench, and he just got, like, absorbed into a mass of people celebrating. And if you haven't seen the video or the GIF or anything, you should watch it because it's it's – it's so heartwarming. I trust I, I trust me, you don't have to be a Capitals fan to enjoy it. It's just such a cool moment where you can see how happy everybody is and just kind of what he means to the team and how well he's been like adopted into the club and the franchise and um it it's it's really quite cute and, and uh he actually scored against Boston tonight too, which was which was awesome. Um I'm sure he that meant a lot to him to, to score against them. Um but um yeah, Chara, like, he's just kind of like the team dad. And, um, you know, Ovechkin was out, Kuznetsa was out, Orla was out, Samsonov was out, and the team got seven out of eight possible points while those guys were out. And Lars Eller was out for a couple games, and Tom Wilson was out, and the team just did so well. And, I, don't, I mean, I'm not saying it's all Chara, but um, just how happy the team was when he scored it. It's just like... He, he must have. He must fits in so well. Yeah, it's so awesome. I mean, you hear stories about Chara uh, over throughout the years, and you always get the the story or people talk about how like he's such like a not a dominating presence, but he's he takes on like an immediate leadership aura to himself, where it's like he walks into a room and people just listen to him. And uh, you know, it was you hear other other players say like he was basically like yeah. a player coach he, throughout his days, even even in his younger years. So I can imagine walking into a locker room like the Capitals where they've got this, you know, this really tight knit and fun group of people where, you know, they're going to be like more than welcoming to have this, you know, gener you know, legendary defender of this generation walk in and, you know, he's part of the team now and they're just going to welcome him right in. So like you said, it's just an amazing moment to see how happy they all were for him when he scores that first goal. And just, you know, there's just so much exuberance from everybody on the bench that, uh, that he got that marker out of the way. Yeah, and um, there was a video that came out uh, during training camp of uh, Kuznetsov borrowing his sticks, and uh, I think Kuz Kuznetsov was wired, was mic'd up, and uh, he was just asking about his stick, and they were skating around, and Chara was just talking to him about, like, oh, yeah, you can custom order it, like, with this sort of, like, grip and sort of stuff, and um, Kuzi was just playing around with, like, this giant stick, just having a laugh, but... Um, you know, Chara was like telling him about like, yeah, you can order this, blah, 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 blah. And he was just like taking the time to talk to him and like get to know him. And it was, it was just such a legend. And, um, you know, you mentioned like the, the kind of the, the stories about him. And I always remember a story where, um, he was at the Olympics and I, I think it was, I think it was the Vancouver Olympics. And, uh, I don't remember what context, if it was arriving at the airport or leaving the airport or, or something like that, but he happened to be like close to Henrik Zetterberg and Zetterberg had like you know notorious back issues and uh Char ended up like carrying his bag for him <laughs> like that's yeah because like, he just he saw him like struggling with it or something and was just like I'm gonna let me just grab this for you and like they're not teammates they're not from the same country they, you know they're they're competitors but he just had that respect for him and he's just such a good guy and um I'm just happy that he's part of the team and that he's fitting in and that, um, you know, he's still contributing and a valuable member of the team. And, um, you know, it's always cool to see guys who are such warriors and, you know, they're in their forties and they're still a valuable member of the team. Yeah. And, um, he's doing really well. And, he um, was quarterbacking the power also, play today too, I think. <laughs> like I'm pretty sure I saw him. Yeah. He's, he's just yeah, a legend. So like that's, that's incredible what he's still able to do in a league that's continually getting younger. Yeah. I mean, he's, blasts it like 100 miles per hour um but um another guy that i was skeptical about um was uh justin schultz and he actually was playing really well when he was in the lineup um when um the team had all those guys out schultz was was really good um he ended up taking a uh, puck to the face and has hasn't been in since but um he's he looked really good and it was really surprising to me. I, I was kind of skeptical about his signing, and um, but uh, the, the Capitals were playing with, pardon me, both him and uh, Carlson on the power play when Ovechkin was out, and it worked. It really worked. And so, um, 
happy that the team is clicking um, and doing so well. And that um, in that game where Char got his first, just battling back to score five goals in a period when you just, you know, had nothing going in the first is just amazing to see. Say a further um, test to the regal lead being the safest just, lead know, in that hockey. Good. <laughs> yes. I think it must have been uh, Laviolette, you know, he must have just sparked the boys or something cuz there's times when the Capitals would not would not battle back like that. And um I think that's, you know, it's some some of the times it comes down to coaching, just being able to inspire the guys to to go out there and get something going and to, you know, keep playing our game don't don't change it just keep playing our game and you know put pucks on the net and um i love to see that i, I thought that they really needed that and also vetchkin being out and all these core guys being out has really brought the guys together i think and so it's uh it's cool to see as a fan of the team and just as a, a hockey fan just you know when you're basically at 50 percent of the salary cap and you're still winning games <laughs> it's, it's pretty pretty awesome uh, I I love it. So on the uh, on the notes of teams doing well, I wanted to switch over to the Florida Panthers real quick because they're actually having a really solid start to the season here, uh, especially considering the division that they're in and the troubles that their division have had with uh, games being put. Panthers are undefeated in regulation, if I b remember correctly. Um, they're sitting at you know the top of the of the central division. Yeah, they're kind of on a sneaky start to the season because they had a bunch of games postponed that uh, weren't because of them. And so they've kind of flown yeah, under the I mean, radar a little bit at how good they I looked they're earlier playing. today and paid attention. I'd never realized they were actually still, you know, you know, they're not first in the league in points, but they're their highest points percentage in the league, sitting at 5-0-1 right now. So, you know, they're still the only undefeated team in regulation. And, you know, they're, they're playing well. And this is, you know, like we said, like I said, in a division that they weren't supposed to really be able to compete against Tampa Bay and Dallas. Yeah, I, I haven't watched any of their games, but I know that they've, they've split up their, um, their usual top line of Barkov, Huberto, and, uh, um, well, blinking. Um, wow. Uh, Who else is on that I line, <laughs> usually? Oh, I guess... Dadanov would have been on that line, um, but um, they've they've got uh, Duclair and Barkov and Carter Verhage playing together, and then I think Huberto's on the second line, um, and I'm not sure who he's playing with, but um, you know they've had to split it up, and they had that whole thing with Yandel at the beginning of the season. They didn't know if he was going to play and um, if he was going to be scratched and kind of a lot of drama around that but um you know they're, they're playing really well and i think they're i think they're rolling both dreger and bob right now it's kind of funny that you spend like what like 11 million dollars on two goalies and one of them makes 10 and uh you end up splitting games <laughs> so perfect segue into my next point here yeah um you know you've got bobrovsky you know obviously you're all you know uh, ten ten million dollar goalie splitting games with Chris Dreger and Bobrovsky again. We you know he's, we know he struggled last season. He's sort of been a slow starter here and there in his career, but you know he's still sitting at a sub nine hundred save percentage, eight ninety four, and a two eighty seven goals against average. And Chris Dreger has a nine thirty seven save percentage and a one ninety five goals against average, and they've played the same amount basically. So. You know who do, who who do you roll with really in that situation? It's like is, when is Bobrovsky gonna turn it around? Because that's starting to look really really bad for them. Yeah, that's god awful, <laughs> really bad. Um, I mean, it's how long? Yeah, how long does that happen until you be like, okay, well, Dreger's our guy, right? Like he's the guy. Um, how much? How how? Can he prove himself <laughs> if he's making the same amount of starts and has a better save percentage, um, better goals against average? Like, how long does he have to be there until they're like, okay, exactly. well, we got to do something about this Bobrovsky thing because that's just so much wasted money. You could be like 
Columbus and have two goalies for less than what you pay Bob that are putting up better numbers than him. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we're one season into his, his deal now, you know, heading into the second year and it's already looking like, you know, one of the worst contracts in the league and it's kind of running out of time to switch that to, you know, kind of break out of that category. Yeah. I mean, if he was putting up godlike numbers, it would be one thing, but if he's on the cusp of losing his job to the guy who makes one tenth of what he makes, <laughs> it's not, not ideal. Um, yeah, I'm sure that uh, you know everyone's frustrated with that and just wants him to to do well. But I mean, that's not going to be an easy contract to move. No, well, no, because no one is going to have that money. No one has that cap space to take on a ten million dollar goalie. So Florida's going to end up having to eat a whole bunch yeah. of it and not get much out of it. And still, I think I think still even even with Florida retaining as much as they can, you end up with you know, a $5 million goalie who is putting up numbers for as a backup. That's, that's not looking too good there. And with the length of the contract too, like that's, you know, six more years. This is, you know, five more after this year. This is the sixth last of the contract. Yeah. And uh, a no movement clause too. So um, have fun with that. Like over 10% of the cap goalie that you got there. <laughs> yeah not ideal on that note though you know who do you do you put him in that worst contract one of the worst contracts in the league yet is it too is it too early or is I it think he's in there right in now right now yeah how he played last year and how he's playing so far this year yeah yeah for what he's currently bringing the team in value definitely up there for yeah one of the worst i would i would say he's probably got to be top five i have him yeah i uh i've got a few jotted down just curio out of curiosity and i mean i've only got three other nito- like okay, really so. bad ones uh being jeff skinner drew dowdy and eric carlson yeah so you know jeff skinner has seven years left at nine million dollars per season and he's currently got <laughs> one point in 10 games after his 23 point uh season last year uh, Drew Doughty, seven years left at eleven million per year, and Eric Carlson also seven years left at eleven point five million per year. Yeah. Um, one that comes to mind is Louis Erickson. Um, he's got two more years at six million. He hasn't played a game this season um, for Vancouver. And on that note, you can throw in like James Neal and Milan Lucic. They've got the same the same type of contract there not quite the the dollar value so i didn't put them in this list just because they don't have the the dollar value associated with it that these other ones yeah do. i mean james neal is still you know way better than louis erickson too he's he can score still um yeah whereas louis <laughs> he's is situationally a, effective basically a penalty killer <laughs> and a press box hero right now um so that one's pretty bad but i guess it only has two <laughs> more seasons so it's not um not the worst um but yeah i'm with you on that skinner one that one's that one's looking really garbage and you know if you can't crack the top six and uh in buffalo it's pretty rough but uh, yeah I, I, um yeah i wonder what uh some other bad ones are um brent burns um i threw phil kessel on there because he's underperformed the last couple of years but his contract's almost done um, then you've got the Suter and Parisi uh, contracts in Minnesota that uh, that take both of them until they're 40 years old. They still have like four more years left on those deals. But at least at least Suter for sure is still a workhorse for Mini, so it's not exactly a bad contract. It just might be in a few more years, and Parisi's kind of yep. on the downswing, but still. Brent Seabrook. Still a useful Brent's player a for them, I think. That's a pretty bad one. Um, 6.8. Signed to the end of 2023-24, and he's also got no movement. Um, I mean, yeah, one of those cup contracts. Yeah, and he's yeah. basically not even Definitely. able to Definitely play a anymore. Rough one. Um. Yeah, I'd say. I'd say Dowdy and Bob are probably my 
my top two worst ones. Those are those are bad. Yeah. You know, I would argue for the present moment that Doughty would be the least bad of those ones because he is still at least useful. The contract itself is not great because it's taking him so late into his career that he's probably going to be getting paid $11 million to sit in the press box. But at least for the moment, he's still a serviceable player. You know, I, I'd put Jeff Skinner's as worse because Skinner's like playing on the fourth line in Buffalo. Yeah. For for $9 million a year. And I mean, Bobrovsky's getting overtaken. Like, he's not even, you know, he's not a, he's not a very serviceable player putting up a sub-900 save percentage and losing losing his starting role to Chris Dreger. So at least Doughty's yeah. still kind of yeah, absolutely top-line defender. Bob's is it's arguably the worst one in the league for sure. <laughs> it's a uh, that's a rough spot to put the whole franchise in when it's that much money um, and that much term left, and it's a goalie. It's like a defenseman. Like at least you have other D men, <laughs> but you know, and you got some cups out of it too, right? Yeah. So, um, that's part of it as well, um, but. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Bobrovsky's. You know, if he was putting up Carey Price numbers, playing like Carey, it wouldn't be. It would be one thing. He's not. So yeah, probably the worst one in the league. Yeah, and I mean, even then, like Carey Price making what he does, he K- Carey Price making what he does, you know, similar to Bob, um, has had criticism of his contract a couple of seasons, a few seasons ago when uh, when Price was kind of struggling a bit. You know, that's kind of dissipated now that price has kind of rebounded and has been good for a couple of years but you know someone like Carey price who was still a serviceable goalie at the time and then comparing it to Bobrovsky who is definitely not is uh no yeah it's, it's not a good look no definitely not so that wraps things up for this time here on clappercast make sure you rate review and subscribe to our show on any podcast platform and spread around the good word of clappercast to keep up to date with the latest content, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Clappercast Media or on Twitter at Clappercast. Thanks for listening, and we will be back next week with more Hockey Talk.